Hi, I guess everybody can hear me? Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, I'm going to be talking about legal stuff. But before I begin, I was just wondering, anybody here who's dealt with an ethics committee or consent forms, anything like that? So consent forms or maybe internal ethics boards? No? In the context of your PhD research or any kind of research? Yeah, okay. So you're going to have a basic idea of what I'll be talking about. Um, for those of you who haven't yet, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have a question. Okay. So we're going to go over a bit over FAIR data. Since Anna already talked about that, I'm going to be really quick. Um, the meat of the presentation is about the GDPR. We'll mention the specific research ethics rules for Horizon-funded projects, a couple of new proposals, and then we're going to move on to more practical things. All right. So you've heard about FAIR data already. Um, as Anna explained, it depends on who you're funded by. European Commission is really pushing the openness of data. Started with Horizon 2020, now with Horizon Europe. Um, oops. Oops. OK, this was not supposed to happen. Um, yep, 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 yep. Spoiler, spoiler, spoilers. Right, anyway, so um, um, is there anybody from the States here? No. No? Okay, so they're also asking people who are publicly funded to open up their data. It's no longer just a European specialty. So as you know by now, the research data must be fair, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. You will also learn about the data management plan already, but we're asking slightly different questions when you talk to a lawyer. And we focus on data protection. So in terms of whose data are we going to be dealing with in a research project, and how easy is it to single out an individual when you process the data, and what could you learn about this person? Right, so what is personal data? This is a thing we'll talk about over and over today. There are four building blocks of the definition. So you have information relating to an individual who is identified or identifiable. So for example, let's see what could be personal data. If you run a shopping mall and you have a camera that's doing surveillance, so you know, to prevent theft, to make sure that employees are not mistreated. Could that be personal data? So let's say, is there a camera in here? No, okay. Um, so if we go back to the definition, a camera in a shopping mall, yes or no? Yes, yes, especially if you can see people with it, right? Because if you're just, for example, if it's just in a warehouse and you only have the goods that are shipped by robots, yeah, you don't have people there. But the moment you're taking footage of the shoppers, yeah, that's personal data. Exactly. Biometrics? Yes. OK. IP address, static or dynamic? What would you say? Static, I think, is easy, right? Because your internet service provider can easily identify you. What about dynamic? Yeah, you, you'd think it wasn't, but it is. Um, because in principle, you do look like you're anonymous because the number keeps changing. But your internet service provider does have um, that bit that does connect you to your, to your IP address. So as we'll see later on, the moment somebody can identify you, somebody out there, then you are, in fact, handling personal data. A traffic jam on the highway, numbers keep going up because most of the cars are occupied by only one person. Yes or no? This is something you hear on the radio. I'd argue no, unless you are going for the license plates. Because if it's just a, you know, a piece of statistical information, okay, the traffic has gone up by 30% because of single occupancy, no problem. But if you have, for example, a camera that is then doing automatic plate recognition, yeah. Uh, you buy a beautiful house somewhere in Greece, and its value of half a million 
is posted online somewhere. Yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? Um, so let's say no, unless, for example, your name is next to it. Or if the tax authorities from Greece are then going through your file and like, yeah, please pay up your tax. In that case, yes. Yeah, yeah. And as we'll see later, it's super easy actually to identify people even when you think you can't or when you would say that it's not possible. Yeah, so what we were just saying, right, that it's a wide definition. We just talked about how easy it is to identify somebody. Um, so in the end, you find out that it's ac you actually come across personal data really easily, also in research contexts where you wouldn't think so. Okay, so in case of doubt, if you're not sure if it is personal data or not, um, try to play it safe so that you don't run into trouble later on. Um, if you're unsure, consult maybe the data protection officer if your university has one. Maybe talk to your PI. And then we move on to the GDPR. What is it? It's a general data protection regulation. It's a law that applies on European level for the last four and a half years and deals, of course, with the protection of personal data. A um, couple of stories why we care about data protection at all. Um, which, yeah, you said how easy it is to identify people. So there was an MIT study from 2015 in which they took people's, so four data points from their credit card purchases in supermarkets. And if you know two dates and two locations of the where, when and where the purchase was made, you can identify over 90% of people. So it's actually fairly easy to track people. Um, my favorite story, my experiment opting out of big data, is about a lady. She decided to go completely offline during her pregnancy. Why? It's because pregnant women, especially first-time moms, are the world's biggest advertisement market. And she decided to go against that and only used cash or physical coupons. She never shopped on Amazon. She always went to a physical shop. Uh, she blocked people on Facebook if they congratulated her on her pregnancy. And what happens one day? FBI shows up at her door asking about money laundering charges. Why? Because there was a system somewhere that picked her up as suspicious. <laughs> Which I think is fairly terrifying. So when do you want to use the GDPR? It's when you process personal data. We saw already what personal data are. What is processing is pretty much anything you do with the data, um, from consultation to any kind of statistical operations. Even, for example, if you anonymize your data, that process itself is considered processing, disclosure, retrieval, etc. So honestly, it's pretty much anything you do. Is it done manually or automatically? It doesn't matter. They both fall under th this definition. So the moment you have something that is or could be personal data and you do something with it, GDPR. All right. Um, there's a category of personal data that have a slightly more restrictive regime, and those are data that have anything to do with racial origin, religion, politics, se sexual orientation, genetics, biometrics health data, anybody working in medicine, clinical trials, health of any sorts, yeah, you're, you're likely to encounter these then. Um, normally, you cannot really do anything with these data unless, well, you can escape this if you either get explicit consent from the person or, for example, if we're talking about public interest in the area of public health, for example, this was during the pandemic, you didn't have to go around asking people for consent. You could instead just rely on this part of the law, this provision, and then various epidemiological and public health studies could go ahead anyway. Oops. Okay. Definitions. So what is genetic, biometric, and health data? If you're unsure if you fall under this or not, take a look at the definitions. Okay. 
Um, there's a trend that, uh, due to current, so the, the, the latest decisions by the court, is that many of the personal data, which are regular personal data, are now considered sensitive. So for example, if you post a picture together with your partner, somewhere on Instagram, you can tell from that somebody's sexual orientation usually, right? Or if you're handling marriage certificates, you will see the name and the sex or the gender of both partners. So I would say that we're going to be in a bizarre situation where almost everything will end up being sensitive personal data and you fall under this restrictive regime. We'll see how things happen. The thing is, normally pictures are not sensitive personal data unless you have biometrics. So like we said earlier with the, with the CCTV, right, if you have facial recognition, but apparently now pictures are sensitive personal data. Also, I would argue that, <laughs> I mean, you can tell somebody's racial origin usually from a picture or from their name. Um, so we'll see how this ends up. But in case of doubt, if you're unsure what kind of personal data you are handling, ask around at your university. Usually they do have some kind of internal rules on what to do with personal data or sensitive personal data. Maybe the DPO or the ethical board can help you as well. Um, who has the obligations? There are two entities. You have the data controller who runs the show and the data processor who helps out. Um, in very simple English, the data controller decides how and why you're going to do something with the personal data and the data processor then just execute the action. This is typically your host service or cloud service. Um, and you can be either or, you cannot be both at the same time. If you do everything yourself, then you're a data controller. And if you have a tool that you're using, say Google Docs, then that's your data processor. Why is it important to choose one? Oh, okay. Um, there's a recent case about a Danish local community. They, they had an evidence of, of all the children that went to their local kindergarten and they were using Google Forms for that. And then the Danish authorities said, no go, you got to stop with that. Uh, they imposed a fine on them. I'm not sure if they had to erase the data or not. But anyway, imagine <laughs> you're about to finish, you've already written everything out, and then they, there comes a decision saying, okay, no, you got to delete everything because you chose the wrong tool. Um, I think this is... I think this is a real problem in academia because we all have really limited funds, so you can't go for the fancy software. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm repeating myself, but ask within your university, ask the DPO if there is one. Um, what do they usually advise people to use? For example, maybe instead of Google Forms to collect your participants' answers, in one project we tried EU survey, which at least is confirmed by the commission as our funder that it's okay, um, do ask. But I think that Google products are starting to be in the spotlight, and I'm not sure how long we will be able to use them for. Um, okay, we'll come back to this in a bit. So, there are some specific rules on data protection in the research, in the GDPR. Actually, a scientific research, they count pretty much everything from theoretical to applied research, technological development, also public health studies, even if they are not done by universities. Um, and then what does that mean? Usually, or at least in principle, it means that we shouldn't need to ask for consent every single time you want to do something with the data, but we'll see that this is a little more complicated than that. Um, questions? Just feel free to raise your hands. Okay, so the law wouldn't be the law unless it gave people things to do. So let's talk about obligations. I'm going to skip the principles because I think otherwise we'll spend too much time on them. Uh, the most important thing is you need to have some kind of legal basis to do things with the data. And that's basically finding a legal argument that says, yeah, go ahead and process these personal data. We have six types. Uh, in research, I think most often we're dealing with consent, especially if you're collecting new personal data. 
Sometimes if you already have data that, that are already in databases, nice and clean, ready for your use, I think you could rely on legitimate interest. Uh, if you do go for consent, there are some fairly strict criteria. So do not use boxes that are pre-ticked. You always have to give a person so an empty box and they say, yes, I agree. Please go ahead and use my data. Um, don't use difficult legal language. Um, just try to explain in as simple terms as possible. And keep in mind that if it is easy to give consent, it must also be very easy to withdraw it. Um, there was one of those, um, it's like an online subscription service for clothing, which I think is a terrible business model, but anyway. Uh, very easy to sign up, and then they send you new clothing every month. But if you want to say no, you had to call a number in France. Yes, that was only answered. Monday through Friday, business hours. So good luck. Oh, and you had to pay to call them. <laughs> So yeah, uh, make it easy to, to opt out again. Um, anybody who's dealing with children? Yeah, so people under 16. Um, this one's a little complex because the GDPR won't tell you a lot about it. You actually have to consult national law. And it is likely that at some point you will have to involve the parents to give authorization. OK, data that's already out there. Do you need new consent or not? Has anybody taken data out of already existing databases? Yes, right? I think we all have. Um, <laughs> so GDPR says, no, 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 go ahead. This is reuse for scientific reasons. Please use this data. Uh, what the advisory body says, so the top EU data protection watchdog, no, please ask for consent again. Uh, also, the internal ethics boards, and there's a very good study that's coming out in Frontiers in Medicine, is also that ethics boards and funders like European Commission, they always want new consent. So what do you do? I would say again, first ask your internal people, do I need consent or not? Try to have something in writing. Um, and never, never argue with your funder. <laughs> So if they want consent, then you give them consent. Uh, you're you're going to waste time. We always waste time in projects, like three, four months, just to ask consent from all the participants. But yeah. What does your funder say, or your university? Did they give you any instructions? Uh, no. no. <laughs> OK. Ask them. Ask them. Um, I mean, we had this problem in a, in a project where we were doing like phishing awareness training, and we took data from people's uh, open Facebook profiles. Uh, and when, then we gave them the option of opt-out, basically. But we knew who everybody was because they were employees of the companies we were working with. Um, and the European Commission was super strict with us, actually, when it came to consent. But when you're trying to fake fish someone, you can't really ask them in advance, because otherwise they'll know, and then you have a bias in your study. Um, but yes, they were very strict with us. We had to demonstrate that we had some kind of general consent in advance. And then people could always say after the study that they opt out and we had to delete everything. Um, so to actually say, yeah, just ask within your university. Yeah. Opa. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing I, I always want to scream at the commission for. Because yes, I mean, if we weren't in a research environment, that's exactly what you would do. Even if it is sensitive data, it is manifestly made public by the data subject. You literally have a legal ground in the GDPR. But your funder is saying, I want consent. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If you're in a marketing company or marketing department of a company, it's actually less problematic than in research, which is bizarre and paradoxical and not the way it should be. Um, but I think you're likely to have to ask consent. But then again, I mean, if you don't know who the people are, I don't know how the ethics board would expect you to do that. Um, 
I've only dealt with European Commission as a funder. Um, in this study that I cite here, but it's not out yet, they do address some of those things. I'm not aware of any like academia-wide initiatives. I think it's mostly on research level that they are saying, like, please, funders, change your practices. Um, it would be interesting to see uh, if there's something that we can join. Um, because why should, I mean, I'm sorry, but why should research, which really is in the public interest, why should we have more complications than marketing, you know? Yeah. Uh, same thing when it comes to startups who want to do things in e-health, for example. They usually have this barrier that you're just not sure under the law, do you need this consent or not? I know, I don't have an answer. Um, so, you found out that you are dealing, in fact, with personal data. What now? First step can be panic, but step number two, you can always adopt some safeguards. So, things that show, okay, I'm paying attention, I want to carry out ethical research, and these are the things I'm doing. Please do not be mad at me, ethics board. The first thing that I would usually do in a project is a data protection impact assessment, or a DPIA. Um, this is a it's like an exercise, an analysis that you go through to figure out what could be possible privacy risks to the people that you are dealing with. So your research participants, or if you took data from a database, so the data subjects whose data is in the database. And it also demonstrates that you are trying to comply, you're doing your best to be lawful and ethical. Uh, the nice thing is that there are existing tools out there my personal favorite is probably the first one that I cite here. So it's from the French Data Protection Authority. It's free for use, it's open source, and there's an app on their website. Uh, there's a couple of others. You can use the one from University of Maastricht. But in my experience, it's most useful for companies. Maybe if you are privately funded rather than publicly, that's a useful thing. And then uh, if you're looking to go further into this, for example, for a paper or something, there's a nice collection of approved methodologies for an impact assessment. Because actually there isn't like a, you should use only this form and nothing else is good. You're free to use whatever, actually whatever answers the, the risks adequately. When is it obligatory? Mm. There's a very nice yes and no questionnaire that I link to here. So you go through, are you dealing with health data? Are you dealing with children's data? Is this a new technology? Is it biometrics? Do you have facial recognition, etc.? cetera? Uh, normally, if you have two or more of those criteria, you should consider doing a DPIA. One caveat, though, is that I don't think I've seen a lot of DPIAs done for somebody's dissertation. It's mostly something that is done for the research project as a whole. So maybe it's going to be one of the reports that you need to submit alongside your research. And you're probably not going to be the only person involved in those. Um, I gave you some materials, and we're going to do a DPIA later on. It's adapted from a project that I worked on. So you can see how it is. Um, yeah. And it's also great because it gives you a chance to reflect on, okay, but what are the wider implications of my research? What does this mean for the society or for the people that you're working with? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we're not going to do this one. This one was for technical partners in a project, basically yes and no questions. And sometimes they had to say, like, you see there on the right, I don't know, what is the context of the process saying? How are you storing everything, et cetera? What are the security measures that you're taking? For example, they had servers in somewhere within their facilities, and then only people who had the right kind of authorization could access them. That's the kind of answer we were looking for. Um, another thing to do is pseudonymization or encryption of personal data. This one's useful because you remove that identifying bit. So for example, instead of a full name, you would use, I don't know, random letters, or maybe the first letter of the surname of your parents, whatever place you were born. 
Uh, this is useful because it makes the person less likely to be identified if something were to happen to your data set. But you are, of course, still dealing with personal data. So this is not an, uh, these are not anonymized data. I see that this is, um, um, this is a mistake that, a ma that many people make. This is still personal data, but it is considered by the authorities and the funders to be more secure then, because at least you mask the identity of someone. And uh, of course, keep that other information separately. Um, so we had, a, the, the, we had a project in which uh, people's information was kept in a locally hosted Excel sheet. And this one was then encrypted with a password. So you would send the Excel form through email and then just text or Skype the password. So don't, don't send those things together because then you haven't really done much. Um, oy. Okay, another thing to do is to keep records of processing activities. Um, so in the sense that who accessed the data or who were they disclosed to, why, who does it refer to, so which people's data or which, yeah, which participants' data was disclosed. Uh, was it an external person, internal person? It's also called a need to know basis. You see this in companies often. Okay. I think my favorite option is to carry out research without personal data. This is not always possible because sometimes you just have to know things about your participants. It doesn't really make sense to invent a person if you're doing clinical studies, for example. Um, but there are a lot of advancements made in terms of synthetic data. So um, data that are generated through machine learning. I found two recent papers how synthetic data were used in COVID-19 research and maybe for clinical trials as well. I am not a technical person. So to me, it seems very smart and uh, super clever when I read about this. But of course, I can't tell you if your research project can be done with synthetic data or not. But it's great because it allows you to escape the GDPR as a whole. So you don't have to deal with consent um, you don't have to have like all the rules that we just talked about. Um, I saw the website, uh, this person does not exist. Anybody knows it? Yeah, it's like a machine generated people's faces. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay, those were made out of, of course, people's actual photos, so personal data. But that's a problem that the creator of those pictures has to deal with. So as a research actor, you can just say, yeah, but this is not personal data. This is machine generated. Um, so in that way, you then, yeah, you fall outside the scope of the law, which I think is great. So obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. I, I gave you some examples on how to deal with compliance. Um, you can also do things such as ask for extra consent, even when it's strictly speaking not necessary, just to make sure that people are on board, that they understand what is going to happen with their data, what will happen to them as a research participant. Uh, you can have more fancy security measures, or maybe instead of cloud hosting, go for a local host. Um, and of course, some universities again, have internal security procedures or internal security rules. This is probably something you should ask uh, people who deal with data management, maybe data stewards or so. Uh, and it will be, yeah, this is really something that every university decides for themselves. All right, so what did we talk about? We went through who is covered by the GDPR. So we talked about controller and processor. So the person who runs the show and the person who does things for them, or not so much a person, but an uh, organization. Um, we talked about what are personal data, if you remember the pictures of the house and of the shopping mall. Yeah, okay, well, we, we skipped the data quality principles, but I think this is something that, unless you're doing very fancy things with personal data, I don't think, I just don't want to give you too much information, to be honest. But if you do have questions about data minimization or something like that, by your funder or by your university, they are in the slides together with more information. Uh, we talked about the thorny issue of new consent or no new consent, reuse of already existing data. 
Oy. Uh, and of course, the safeguards such as data protection, impact assessment, synthetic data, extra consent, and so on. Okay, who here is funded out of Horizon? Whoever is not sure, you can always ask your professor. <laughs> but at my faculty, 90% of PhD students, including myself, are paid out of Horizon funding. Uh, so this means things from projects with the industry, Marie Curie, European Research Council. So actually, chances are that many of us fall under this. There are also internal, um, so internal funding from the university or maybe national funding. Some people have private funding. But a lot of us will have to, at some point, talk to the European Commission about their research ethics. So these are specific rules that apply to all EU-funded grants. Um, and uh, yeah, so the rules are actually old from Horizon funding, but they just, they just copy-pasted them for Horizon Europe. So apparently, the same things still apply. Uh, when should you look at that? Okay, of course, first, if you're EU-funded. But if your research proposal has any of those things, so you're, you have human embryos, you have research participants, human, human tissues, personal data, are you dealing with animals? Non-EU countries is interesting because countries like Norway and Switzerland are not a problem. I'm not sure what the status of the UK is. If anybody has a project together with a UK university, I'm not sure you might want to check that. Um, Israel used to be okay. I think they are now slowly leaving them out of research. Uh, then there's environment, health and safety, AI, that's a new one. Other ethics issues and misuse of results. We had a question at one of the projects. What are the procedures you will take to make sure your research cannot be used by military? I don't know. <laughs> And then you have this very complicated rules about, it's called the Wassenaar Agreement, um, about which, which items could be used by the military, and then what you can do as a researcher or what your university can do to prevent the military from using your results. Uh, and those are all things that you have to provide documentation for when you apply for the grant and then while you're researching. Um, fellow PhD students, have you had to apply for any Horizon funding or anything like that? No. I've done a bunch of those, but apparently it's super unusual that like, people lower than postdocs have to do them. Um, but if you do get funded, at some point you will have to provide the commission with all sorts of information and documentation. because. They want answers to what they believe raises ethics questions. So for example, if you have participants in your project, you will have to then tick the boxes. So are they patients? Are they vulnerable uh, subjects? Which actually includes people like employees as well. Um, what are your informed consent procedures? Do you, have, do you have people, let's say, with Alzheimer's? Then you have to have slightly more simplified consent forms. Um, do you have people with mental disabilities, etc.? So basically, you answer yes, no to questions, and then you put there some kind of justification. Okay, we will do this for these and these reasons. Yeah, um, kind of depending on what your field of research is, there are going to be even more <laughs> detailed rules. So we have a specific guidelines on ethics and data protection. This one's nice because it comes with a decision tree. So then you can see, do you fall under these rules or not? Then you have rules for social sciences, developing countries, et cetera. Um, these apply on top of the law. So you do have to, the moment you have personal data, you will have to do both the GDPR and the guidelines. Uh, the good news is that they are mostly in line with one another. So you don't have a whole lot of contradiction apart from the consent thing. Uh, some other rules, people who work with health data, nobody else? Clinical studies, psychology, well-being, yeah. Um, there's a new proposal that just came out. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. 
Uh, basically, it makes it easier for us researchers to access data, but we also might have to share it more in the future. This is still in the proposal phase, so uh, European Parliament is still debating what the rules are going to be, and we'll see. We'll see where it ends up. Um, yeah, feel free to read the blog posts. I think that they explain very well what is going to happen. Uh, the other thing is Data Governance Act. Uh, this one focuses on altruistic data sharing. So the idea is that research organizations can access data that is held by public bodies right now. So for example, governments, public agencies, and so on, they will have to make their data freely available for use. This is not the case yet, but it, it will be, or it could be once this is then passed by the parliament. Um, and it's going to be nice because you suddenly have a whole lot more relevant data for you that you won't have to collect yourself, but it will be there. Uh, and it is possible that also we, as university staff, will have to share our research data as well. All right, so this is it when it comes to theoretical stuff. Um, I gave you a sample of a data management plan, which is from, again, from an old project. Um, I just wanted to tell you about, so who here has had to do a data management plan already? No? All right, but some of you will have to carry it out, I think. You will have to give it to your funder or to your university. Okay, no, but anyway, um, I'm giving you a sample, which is like questionnaire about fair data, and then I included what we wrote about the ethics aspects. So feel free to reuse some of the ethics part because it's fairly generally written for your own research if it is demanded by your university that you should answer ethical questions. It's an actual project uh, report, so it's a legit thing. I just redacted the technical parts. Yeah. And then on the very last page, we wrote about ethical stuff. Feel free to reuse that if ever necessary. Okay, the other thing, I figured we could do a data protection impact assessment and an informed consent procedure together. Do you want to break before that or do you just want to go ahead? Huh? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> this one's from my current project and we are basically working with people living with Alzheimer's, living in care homes. And we wanted to make some kind of app that they could use. Oi. <laughs> Welcome to academia. I actually thought we could do this maybe in groups of three or four people. We still have half an hour. Uh, do you prefer to work on questions on your own? I think it's nicer if you're like three, four together. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I'm gonna ask you to move around a bit so that you can sit together with your group mates. <laughs> All right. So the context is, we are developing an app for people who live in care homes um, so that they can contact their doctor or their nurse and that they can monitor their, so their heartbeat and, I don't know, blood oxygenation, how much did they sleep, did they fall, are they able to move? Are you guys sure you don't want to break? No? Okay. Um, yeah, so... As developers, we really want to ask our patients for their feedback. And we want to make sure that we are carrying out our research ethically. So we have to do a data protection impact assessment, and we have to ask for their consent. So you have a form for a DPIA that should be there, 
and an informed consent sheet. I am on purpose not giving a lot of information because I think that would be way too complicated right now and also not a lot of fun. Um, so feel free to make things up. You can go as broad as you want or as narrow as you want. Yeah, it's this one. And then you have a, yeah, and then you have an informed consent thingy. Yes, that's the one. Um, again, feel free to make, to make things up. This is just for fun and also a bit of awareness and training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I should have showed it on the screen. Okay. And yes, I'm a lawyer. I say this is for fun, but it's not. Juan <laughs> Alipa. Yeah. So yeah, so it's it's this one. It's a two-page doc. <laughs> and that's the data protection impact assessment. It's long. Don't have to answer everything. Okay, so let's say in 20 minutes, and then we talk about results for 15 minutes. I didn't really time this, so. Okay. Do, sh shall we recap? Uh, we have five minutes left. Yeah. Does anybody want to share their answers or what your thoughts are about? If you had to do this for your own work, would it be useful? Does it give you a broader idea of, oh yeah, am I audible? No. Did I manage to make this work again or? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, should we go over the, the questions? Does anybody want to share their thoughts? Like this is not an exam. I don't collect these, no scores or anything. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. If you do something automatic like that, um, you need to watch out if it's a medical device because then you have to go through the whole reg registration process and you have things like health and safety and so on. Uh, and you have to do pre-market monitoring and post-market monitoring and so on. So may uh, maybe this is something that then a pharma company can take up and you develop something for them and then they deal with like what happens after it's marketed, uh, side effects and so on, yeah. Yeah, I mean, also a device, like a smartwatch, it can't interpret all the context, so you do need some kind of human. I'm asking because that is a legitimate question in the, in the GDPR, who makes the final decision. Yeah, a human, yes, 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 indeed. Um, yeah, so actually, one of the things that we want to do, or we we're planning to do in the project is, um, you have an alert that this person has been in the bathroom for an hour, the door is closed, no, mo no movement is detected, <laughs> and that would then alert a caregiver. So like, you know, go check up, what if there was something, you know, something that happened. Okay, maybe they fell asleep in the bath, but maybe they fell. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm actually, I'm not sure how the period is. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and we do have people who are in care homes, we have people who are in assisted living, we're still at home. So three different scenarios, and then kind of tweak the, the app and the settings. We also, we had a question, what do you do if the battery runs out? How easy is it for the person to then, okay, is the device on? How do I turn it on? What do I do now? Or I don't know, do I have to change battery? Do I have to charge it or whatever? Uh, because then, okay, may maybe your baseline is then calculated wrong. That's the kind of question you'd get from the commission. Yeah, but our patients said that they don't like the location function because they felt like they were in prison all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that you then have a functionality that you can turn on and off. Um, you said you would collect the name. Do you need the actual name of the person, everything, or do you just can you just give them like a nickname, like Grandma or something, Grandma X? Yes, exactly. So you have a need. To, uh, you're going to have like a need to know basis. So the app will just see, okay, the pseudonym of this person, but the doctor still knows who it is, or yeah, family member or whatever. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. That's actually what I was uh, trying to get at. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of a privacy by design approach. Anybody else who has a comment? Sure. 
Okay. I just had two more things, like kind of food for thought. We talked already about people with Alzheimer's. And then if I gave you something like that for your own PhD work or for your own research project, think about how you would answer the questions. That's all. But do that after class. <laughs> and feel free, feel free to get in touch if you have questions or if you think this is interesting or if you think it was not interesting. <laughs>